All right there, everybody. The New York Times finally admits that the world is, in fact, becoming nationalist populist. That's what we'll be talking about on today's video. A number of opinion articles are being written as we speak for the New York Times that are all collectively coming to a single conclusion. The world, as we know it, is changing. The world political order is changing, and it is changing in ways that secular liberal globalists, both on the center left and the center right, never imagined in their worst nightmares. The world order is turning nationalist, it's turning populist, and it is turning traditionalist. And the piece that I was most impressed by was written by Brett Stevens, and a huge shout out to our good friend Daryl Dow, who sent this to me. Thank you, Daryl. Brett Stevens puts forward three earth-shattering recent events in his piece. The Australian election, the India election, and this was written before the results of the European Parliament elections were had come in, so he based his assessment on the nationalist populist gains that were being projected at the time. So he puts forward these three things, and he drew, again, a very fascinating conclusion. He wrote, in the past week, uh, over 600 million Indians had cast their ballots over the course of six weeks in the largest democratic election in the world. It takes, it takes India just over a month to hold a national election. And according to Stevens, the big winner in the Indian election was Donald Trump. Then we had several million Australians going to the polls in another touchstone election, their national election. And the big winner there was, again, Donald Trump. Hundreds of millions of people, from his vantage point, were voting in Europe's parliamentary elections. And again, all projections show that Trumpism would largely triumph there. Whether we go to the Philippines and their midterm elections uh, a couple of weeks back that cemented the rule of the nationalist populist President Rodrigo Duterte, or Israel's election just a several weeks back saw a surge in ultra-right Orthodox parties that gave Netanyahu his third straight term as prime minister, or the landslide election of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil back in October of last year, or the rise of Matteo Savini as the single most dominant political figure in Italy, or the gigantic figure of Viktor Orban in Hungary, or the rise of the Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands, and the True Finns in Finland, and on and on and on. We are, wherever we're looking, Donald Trump is winning these elections. And of course, by that, Brett Stevens is simply saying to a largely American reading audience, and a highly left-wing one at that, Stevens is simply saying that the very same issues that dominated and defined the 2016 election here in the States, the issues of borders, economy, and culture, they're all propelling nationalist populist candidates to electoral victories quite literally all over the world. Uh, he could have mentioned Shinzo Abe of Japan or Erdogan of Turkey or the Dream Coalition of the Republic of Georgia. I mean, you know, heck, much of Central America has turned to the right. Uh, most recently, El Salvador, Chile, Paraguay, Colombia. In many ways, Brazil, which Jair Bolsonaro was just a crown jewel of this turn. Uh and who would have thought, and again, Stevens points this out, who would have thought that the successor for Theresa May of the Tories would be someone like Boris Johnson, most likely, who Stevens calls the Trumpiest Tory. <laughs> I love it, right? B Boris Johnson, the Trumpiest Tory. The theme of Stevens' piece is one that we all know too well on this channel. Trump often said it on the campaign trail, right? Trump kept saying, we're going to win so much, you're going to get tired of winning. You're right. At some point, we're just going to keep winning and winning, and you're going to say, please, please stop. We can't do this anymore. We can't keep winning. And he said, sorry, nope, we're going to have to keep winning. And we're going to say, no, it's enough. Too much winning, too much winning. Trump said, sorry, no, we just have to keep winning, winning, winning over and over and over again. And Stevens writes, this is impressive. This isn't the New York Times, folks. Stevens writes, Trump could not have been more prophetic. <laughs> what world are we living in? This is New York Times. Barring a major economic meltdown, Stevens surmises Trump's going to win re-election easily in 2020. And this is because Stevens recognizes that the politics of the left, climate change, open borders, minority rights, economic redistribution, 
it's being crushed by renewed, well, he calls it a tribalization or nativist sentiment. I think nativism is the term he uses. And here, I think he starts to miss the larger picture. In my view, at least, he gets caught up in his own caricatures. But he sees it. He recognizes that right now the left has its only goal, the removal of Donald Trump from office. But in doing that, they're losing the bigger picture. They're failing to see what the nationalist, populist, and traditionalist right has, why it has been winning such impressive victories. And for Stevens, he recognizes, it's because the nationalist populist right is addressing most explicitly and directly the three major insecurities that are redefining world politics, border insecurity, economic insecurity, and cultural insecurity. He recognizes this. And for that, I, I, uh, I commend him. Uh, now, we on this channel, we call these three insecurities post-security politics, okay? Post-security politics is driven by three major forms of insecurity that have arisen over the last few decades as a result of the anti-national, anti-cultural dynamics inherent in globalization. And in many respects, these three forms of insecurity all intertwine with one another. The nation state historically offered its citizens three forms of security by which we could all live out a safe and meaningful life. And these three forms of security were border security, where we felt safe from you know, foreign invasion, economic security, where we were given a stable economy for maximum material conditions, and cultural security, where our religion, our customs, our traditions, our distinctive ways of life were protected and celebrated and revered to ensure a meaningful and uh, collaborative life. Globalization destroys all three forms of security because globalism is transnational. It renders borders irrelevant, either through electronic money or unprecedented immigration rates. Globalism destroys economic security by virtue of what's called a global division of labor, where manufacturing and industry are relocated to third world countries, the global south, while finance is reallocated around the urban centers of the global north, leaving rural areas extremely unemployed. And finally, globalism is perhaps most infamous for killing off distinctive cultures, customs, and traditions with consumer-based culture that pushes progressive lifestyle values at the expense of traditional culture and customs. All the while, the culture ends up being eradicated by massive immigration levels. And so you can see that post-security politics form sort of a self-contained loop where each insecurity feeds into the other. And it is the nationalist, populist, and traditionalist right that's addressing all three insecurities in a fully coherent political ideology of the new right. The political ideology of the new right centers on stringent border enforcement and migration overhaul. They want to institute some form of economic nationalism. And they want to protect the key identity markers of nation, culture, custom, and tradition for the respective populations. And that is why we're entering into a new conservative age. We're entering into a new conservative age precisely because the three forms of insecurity that are plaguing populations all over the planet by virtue of globalization are being effectively addressed and resolved by the nationalist, populist, and traditionalist right. And that's the joy that we have every single day on this channel. With every passing election or current event, we've analyzed the victories of the right with this very analysis. We're understanding current events in light of conservative trends. And it's nice to see other media outlets like the New York Times catching up to us. All right there, everyone. Scholars are recognizing that nationalist populism is now officially a permanent fixture in the new politics of the 21st century. That is what we'll be talking about on today's video. But before we do, just a few more days left to get my latest book, The New Nationalism, How the Populist Right is Defeating Globalism and Awakening a New Political Order Free for a Limited Time is an ebook download on the link below. If you want an understanding of just this amazing turn to the nationalist populist right going on quite literally all over the world, this book was written for you. It's a quick read. 
and it is my gift to you for free for limited time at the link below. Also, if you've not already done so, make sure to smack that bell and subscribe button. We are on our way to 100K subscribers, and it will be a privilege to have you as one of them. There is an excellent article on the NewStatesman.com website entitled, Why National Populism is Here to Stay. It was authored by the British political scholar Matthew Goodwin and uh, does a great job analyzing not only what's at the core of the rising nationalist populism going on all over the world, but also why the globalist mainstream left-wing social democratic parties are still really in denial over this. Goodwin's part of a uh, burgeoning group of scholars who are focusing on the rise of the new conservative age. In our midst, uh, another one is the London-based demographer Eric Kaufman, who's been analyzing demographic trends that suggest that the world is, in fact, becoming more religious and, indeed, more religiously conservative. And so what I want to do here is I, I just want to give you a synopsis of Goodwin's argument because I think it is excellent and should give you plenty of confidence in terms of where we're headed politically and culturally in the coming months and uh, years. He begins uh, with the obvious. When it comes to the current state of Europe, nationalist populist parties are on the rise while social democratic parties have slumped or outright collapsed. So whether we're looking at Italy, Sweden, Denmark, Austria, the Visegrad Four, Slovenia, most recently Latvia, which we talked about in uh, the video the other day, wherever we look in Europe, nationalist populism is on the rise, all the while support for the social democratic parties are falling. And Goodwin uh, points out that while uh, they're all unique to their own particular national circumstance, Nationalist populist parties and movements do have identifiable characteristics. They are all vehemently opposed to liberal globalization and its anti-cultural dynamics. They are staunchly opposed to mass immigration, you know, the corporatist economic policies of our uh, governing elite. Uh, instead, nationalist populists promise to give a voice to those who feel that they're being neglected, uh, if not, frankly, held in contempt by our secular elite, you know, those uh, considered uh, deplorables by our technocratic, globalistic aristocracy. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, uh, and if, again, make sure uh, that you smack that bell and subscribe button if you're not, but if you're a regular viewer here, then you know that these characteristics of the new nationalist populist right flow out of what we call here post-security politics, which involves the three major forms of insecurity generated by transnational globalist dynamics, border insecurity, economic insecurity, and cultural insecurity, all three of which have ushered in what scholars are calling a post security politics, which is driving voters more and more toward a nationalist, populist, and traditionalist political order. Now, what I really like about Goodwin's analysis is that he recognizes how the mainstream left, the globalist center left, social Democrats, uh, and even uh, some of those on the center right, he recognizes that they're collapsing at least in part because they've misdiagnosed the cause of nationalist populism. They, they didn't see these three insecurities provoking this mass backlash in the form of nationalist populism. So they've, they've been far too slow in adapting to this massive political and cultural sea change. In fact, you have the likes of Tony Blair, who actually thinks that the political revolts of 2016, Brexit, Trump, and the like, were cries from the populace for more globalism. I mean, if you can believe it, there are political, economic, and media elite who actually interpreted the political rebellions of 2016 as cries for more immigration, <laughs> more economic deregulation, more cultural liberalism. Moreover, these elites still believe their party loyalty and traditional left and right issues, past voting patterns, that they're all still operative today, when in point of fact, there is evidence of a massive political paradigm shift going on where people are, in fact, switching parties. They no longer see things like party loyalty or traditional left versus right issues as characteristic of their political thinking. Uh, for example, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Donald Trump received more votes during the Republican primaries than any previous Republican in history. 
And that was largely because blue collar Democrats in the heartland and the Rust Belt, as it were, they were switching parties in the primaries and voting Republican for the very first time. This is why Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Pennsylvania, they all voted Republican in 2016 for the first time in 30 years since the 1980s. Now, one of the reasons Goodwin sees for the less inability to adapt to these changes um, is their, frankly, their devotion to Marxist thinking. Because the left is so infiltrated with Marxist thinking, they really believe that nationalist populism is destined to die. Uh, and frankly, because they see nationalist populism as nothing more than the last gasp of a, of a dying population made up of old white men. Uh, remember, cultural Marxism sees old white men as a historic cancer that needs to be eradicated in the inevitable triumph of the third world global south uh, proletariat. So they, so they think this global revolution is inevitable. But as Goodwin points out, there, there's just simply no credible indicators, none that suggests that nationalist populism is a mere blip on the dialectical materialist outworking of history. Everything suggests that nationalist populism is redefining politics and our political future from this time forward. And thus, it's the socialist left that's finding itself dying out. What it all comes down to, uh, and I think Goodwin's right here, where the left really miscalculated was both the Marxist and globalist notion that everything can be diagnosed and resolved through economics. Uh, as opposed to what's really operative here, by the way, which is what's really at issue, which is the dominant concern over culture. The left believed that economic hardship and austerity measures on the one hand and economic inequalities and a lack of opportunities and inordinate material distributions on the other, these were all the cause of this mass dissatisfaction. But again, many of the so-called far-right parties throughout Europe began in the 1980s. That's where they started long before austerity measures were imposed or mass economic hardships began to surface, uh, which was, of course, during the late 2000s. In fact, the nationalist right really began to emerge in places like Austria and the Netherlands during unparalleled economic prosperity. And they began to form coalition governments in the midst of that prosperity back in 2000, 2002, long before austerity and economic downturns were factors. Uh, moreover, studies have found that those who were most concerned about economic disparities actually voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, those uh, who were, saw themselves in poor financial shape were disproportionately more likely to vote for the Democratic candidate, who ended up, of course, losing, and losing quite overwhelmingly, at least in terms of the Electoral College. We, we need to remember that Trump was the first Republican candidate to break past 300 electoral votes since 1988. Now, what we found in terms of the studies is that economic disparity is, is not a reliable indicator in terms of how people vote. What we are finding absolutely is a reliable indicator is the level of insecurity that people feel about their own culture and their own sense of national identity. That appears to be almost absolute in terms of voting patterns. Those with deep-seated anxieties about immigration and national identity overwhelming, overwhelmingly have begun to turn to the nationalist populace. Right, cultural concerns and cultural anxieties are emerging as a clear, reliable indicator of voting patterns among the European and American electorate. And we could see this particularly in 2017 Ipsos Mori poll that surveyed nearly 18,000 voters in 25 countries, and it was very impressive sampling. And it found that 43% of British, 54% of Hungarians, and 63% of Italians believed, and I'm quoting here, that immigration is causing my country to change in ways that I do not like. And there was also a recent poll taken by YouGov that asked voters across Europe what was their top two political priorities. What were the top two issues concerning you the most as a voter? And do you know that the answer that was given was the same in every single state for the exception of one? The answers were immigration and terrorism. The only difference there was Italy. Italians said immigration and unemployment. <laughs> okay. Moreover, the percentage of people who agreed, and I'm quoting again, that traditional parties and politicians don't care about people like me, ranged from a low of 44% in Sweden 
to 61% in Poland and to nearly 70% in France. Now, this goes a long way to explaining uh, some of the voting data that we have from Germany and Britain. In Germany, the main sources for votes for the nationalist populist alternative for Germany, the AFD, in their first time running for election and getting into the parliament with 13% of the vote in 2017, making them the main opposition party. Their main sources for votes were those who did not vote in the previous German election. Same with Brexit. Around 2 million Brits who had not voted in the 2015 general election actually came out and voted for the Brexit referendum. Put all this together, and what you've got are the makings of a new political paradigm sweeping Europe, Britain, United States, and indeed increasingly the entire world. Nationalist populism is here to stay. Its cultural roots are deep and growing ever deeper, and has thus become a permanent fixture on our new and ever increasingly conservative political landscape.